Okay, kia ora everyone. Um, I'm Meg from Priority One um, and we also have uh, Shane here from Priority One. Shane, if you'd like to chuck your camera on for a cameo for, for a second or two. Um, we, uh, my, my role at Priority One is a project manager for workforce development and the future of work. Um, and Shane, um, whether he turns it on or not, he is our innovation manager who works between Priority One and um, the University of Waikato. Um, we'd really like to welcome you all for joining us today um, and really um, thank you for your support in moving this event online. We were just chatting earlier, you know, it's quite easy for all, all, us all to jump online. So um, with some tight schedules to manage um, and some uncertainty on numbers, as well as being able to record this session so we can distribute it to our schools um, and, and others interested, um, we thought this was quite a good solution. Um, so I just want to um, uh, thank Space Space um, and Starboard um, for being here. Um, so for those of you who are not sure who Priority One is, uh, we're the Western Bay of Plenty's Economic Development Organisation. Um, our role here is to really grow a sustainable economy um, that improves productivity and delivers prosperity to our local people and communities. Um, essentially, we, we do this through um, activating work streams in the areas of education, business, infrastructure, innovation and sustainability. So, um, and one of our key unofficial roles is about connection. Um, and so a few months ago, my colleagues and I were at Festival of the Future and we had the privilege of um, seeing Emmeline um, do a presentation there. and. It left us really enamoured and it was really, um, she talked between um, education, future of work and, and the opportunities presented in the space industry. And um, serendipitously, we then that afternoon got an email from our colleague Shane saying, hey, Space Base have got this opportunity and, and would we like to help support them come to tote on us. So that's why we're all here today. Um, and just want to acknowledge everyone taking their time out um, to be here. So um, I'm going to hand it over to um, Emmeline and Eric um, from Space Space and I will let them introduce themselves. Um, their comprehensive resumes are a little bit um, above my uh, skill set so um, I, I think it's best that they introduce themselves um, and our agenda today is that after Emmeline and Eric um, speak about the Space Space for Planet Earth um, challenge um, then we'll hear from um, Dr Moritz Lemon uh, from Starboard um, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So just a logistics thing, um, any questions as we as we go along the presentation, drop them straight into the chat board. Um, it's probably, probably easier because as, as we're going, you, you might pick up different things. Um, so drop them in and we can answer them then um, after the presentation from, um, from Moritz. So that's enough from me. Um, I'll switch my camera off too, um, but uh, yeah. Thank you all for being here and uh, looking forward to our presentation today. Yeah, well, thank you uh, once again, Meg, uh, and for Priority One as well for uh, inviting us to present today and also talk about space base and talk about the, the space challenge opportunity, um, especially for Taranga and but also for the rest of New Zealand and, and also the Pacific region. So um, we're going to share slides in a second. See. Can you all see that? We can. Yep. Awesome. Okay, good. Great. OK, so yeah. Um, so the way that we'll do this briefing is we'll just talk more about ourselves first, uh, the, the motivation for Space Base, uh, and then the motivation for the challenge, why uh, we picked the particular problem area of, of methane this time around. Uh, and then I'll give a little bit of like the process of how you can actually uh, participate in the in the challenge. So a little bit about myself. Uh, so I'm I'm Emeline. I am originally from the Philippines, uh, lived and grew up there, but then uh, immigrated to the U.S. about like 25 years ago. Um, my background is in uh, physics and space science, 
although I actually worked more for about three decades on program development and operations, ranging from space startup companies in the US that are like working on space tourism to all the way to uh, companies that are working on landers and rovers uh, on the moon. I also work uh, quite a bit on space uh, education as well. So uh, International Space University, Singularity University uh, in, in Silicon Valley, uh, and uh, mentored quite a bit uh, for uh, startup companies uh, there. And six years ago, we moved to New Zealand um, for the Edmund Hillary uh, Fellowship Program. Um, hi, I'm Eric Dahlstrom uh, from the US. Uh, I started in physics and astronomy, uh, mapping the galaxy, uh, and then moved into space engineering, working for uh, NASA as a contractor on space station design and other projects. Um, so I worked uh, for the big companies, Lockheed and Raytheon and, and uh, a bunch of them. Uh, uh, I got involved with uh, International Space University, which is how Emily and I met, and uh, I'm still on the faculty for ISU. And then uh, in helping in um, uh, California, helping uh, space startups. Uh. So um, even though we're kind of like based here in New Zealand, we still keep up um, our connections with the space community uh, globally and also are still working on several projects uh, as well back in the US. So um, as I mentioned, we, we came to New Zealand like six years ago. The Edmund Hillary Fellowship Program is for entrepreneurs and investors to come to New Zealand and work on a, an impactful uh, project that can scale. And so we created and co-founded SpaceBase. Um, as I mentioned here, you know, it's to, to democratize access to space by really co-creating space uh, ecosystem, particularly in developing and emerging countries through education, entrepreneurship and community building. And the reason why we've been doing this, because our passion really is to kind of like shrink the gap uh, between like spacefaring nations and the opportunities and benefits of space. Um, to also have the rest of the world uh, be, be able to actually, um, you know, participate and 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 also um, harvest the benefits of it. So um, it's interesting that most people, you know, when they think of uh, space, it's always you know launching rockets or or actually manufacturing satellites and and uh, spacecraft. But uh, at least for us, we're really more focusing on leveraging space technology to solve the grand challenges on Earth. And um, you know, just as an example, the UN. Um, Office of Space um, uh, Affairs, which is based in in, in Vienna. Uh, if you look at their website, every single SDG is actually being addressed by uh, by space technology. And so, um, and one of these uh, in particular, of course, is monitoring the health of planet Earth. And so, we are really very um, focused on uh, making sure that we can leverage space to potentially address climate change, um, which is kind of like one of the, the, the main motivations of uh, the particular problem area that we have for the challenge. And, and again, so just wanted to, to also emphasize that the space industry today is, is really huge and there's a lot of potentials and opportunities, not just for aerospace engineers or you know, physicists or, or scientists, but um, basically everything across the board from life sciences, law to, to medicine, uh, there's a lot of opportunities uh, for everyone. Yeah, and one of the big motivations for us, uh, especially in observing in California, how the uh, acceleration of, of technologies, in, especially in computing, has uh, led to uh, increased power of uh, and de decreased cost across uh, computing, AI, robotics, biotech. Um, and that also applies to, to spacecraft where the space sensors um, are, are so much more powerful, uh, and we'll we'll hear a little bit later about the uh, power being used for the starboard um, uh, down there. Uh, but there's uh, things from uh, hyperspectral imaging to uh, uh, radar uh, uh, satellites and things like that. Um, also, on the analysis side, um, when back when I did remote sensing for NASA, um, every every step took. Fifty thousand dollars of uh, software or computer specialized computers, but now a lot of the satellite data is is accessible through NASA or Euro European Union, 
um, the software has become uh, open source and free, and your your laptop that you use right now is more powerful than the computers we used to use. So uh, we have been trying to share this message across uh, with all our activities in New Zealand for the last five years and trying lots of different methods of, of communicating to the to New Zealand. But one area that we have been focusing on is uh, running challenge competitions. And uh, this is where you set up a big uh, prize and have people work on it for uh, uh, some months to develop their solutions. Uh, there's a long history of this in aviation and in space. The going back to uh, Charles Lindbergh uh, flew to from New York to Paris in order to win a $25,000 prize, and uh, so you have uh, one advantage from these prize competitions is that you get actually you get different approaches to solving the problem, um, and you also uh, a lot of the ideas can, you know, if you, the finalists can actually go on and, and spin off and become companies or or additional research projects, and you basically create a whole network of of collaboration. So in the last challenge we ran, we have we had uh, twenty potential solutions. We had uh, we involved all these different uh, partners in this, and uh, and we have some of the example approaches and solutions for past challenges we've, we've run. We had um, high school students uh, looking at the problem of coral health with remote sensing data. We had uh, people in, in Australia using lasers to measure, you know, tree, uh, how much uh, carbon is being captured by trees uh, and comparing it to lasers from space. And we had, uh, uh, we have uh, monitoring the health of of uh, or the how much the pollution levels in lakes in New Zealand using uh, by monitoring the changing color, so it's it's a, a variety of different solutions that come out uh, addressing the problem. So uh, I'll, we've always we've been motivated uh, uh, to address the biggest you know big problems of climate change with the you know, were familiar with the the. Uh, increasing heating across the planet from the caused by the greenhouse gases. And this amount of energy that's being added into the Earth system is really changing a lot of the weather patterns, moving water and um, increasing droughts, uh, increasing the number of wildfires. And, uh, and all this comes back to the greenhouse gases that we've been adding. Mainly the effect is from carbon dioxide, but methane is a, a big piece of this. And uh, uh, methane, uh, if you can, uh, I, I keep stealing charts from uh, the scientists that we uh, end up uh, inviting to our give talks. And so this was uh, uh, this, the visible light spectra and the near infrared spectra of reflected light where, where the methane is being detected by how much is being absorbed in these near infrared bands. But the real uh, and that's happening over here, but the real heating effect on Earth is is in the far infrared where it's absorbing the radiation that Earth is emitting. And so this is uh, the well understood uh, effects of these greenhouse gases, and this is the way that these are being detected by in from spacecraft. Uh, in the the methane is the reason why methane is is so important is that it's um, it's actually a more powerful at trapping heat than carbon dioxide, and it also is is shorter lived. So that if you can stop the methane emissions, you can actually buy time for uh, dealing with the carbon dioxide uh, and other aspects. And you know some of the sources of methane are are from agriculture or uh, industry or from even from landfills emitting methane. Uh, and there's big emitters of, you know, big countries around the world. And so everybody is interested in this issue. Uh, and here you can see a snapshot of the largest emissions from around the world, from U.S., Europe, Middle East, India, China, and that uh, there's not a great deal of, of strong sources in our area, but, uh, and there are some from, from Australia on the from the uh, 
especially from from uh, coal mines. But um, uh, you can, but any anything any technique that you develop here is is immediately it helps address the global issue of this, and so. We have uh, the natural methane cycle over here with, with emissions in, in absorption in green. And this is the human um, caused emissions uh, being added to the system, most of it being absorbed in the in the natural sinks, but there's still this climbing 10 mega million tons a year, which is climbing up the, the methane emissions um, and is causing about a third of the warming so far. Uh, New Zealand has is in, in invested a lot in this research program to understand the uh, agriculture emissions, and so they even put you know um, poor little sheep in boxes and and or put on these these uh, cuffs to measure the methane emissions, um, and also these elaborate systems to measure at the paddock level. But the ideal situation is if you can have a satellite that actually monitors and can can get a snapshot of the uh, the emissions from each farm. And so when farms uh, change their uh, behavior and improve and reduce the methane, they get credit for this by uh, demonstrating that from the satellite watching this. And so, uh, and for New Zealand, methane emissions from agriculture is, is really accounts for 50% of the greenhouse gases emission. There's a number of satellites that are up there that have been able to detect methane uh, some are designed for it and some are modified so that you can, or with analysis techniques to identify how to detect methane. And uh, a number of these have our free data from NASA or from the Europeans. And so the uh, in our challenge, we're, tr we're finding ways to make this data available or help people identify how to use this data. Um, and uh, we're in this, in some sense, the challenge is preparing for the launch next year of methane set, uh, which is jointly sponsored by the US and New Zealand. Uh, it's going to be, uh, there There exists this Sentinel 5P that is doing a global, you know, low resolution image. And there's also a commercial company, Greenhouse Gas Set, that is looking at very sp specific spots. But methane set is going to be very sensitive and right in the middle uh, of this capability. And uh, so this is where, uh, where we're getting ready for this capability uh, to make New Zealand uh, an expert in the methane uh, monitoring system. So this is the, the problem statement we have written, which is using satellite data in combination with other data sources help develop scientific methods to identify target areas of methane emissions on Earth. So it's it's very broad, so you can you can uh, approach it from many different directions, but the, uh, uh, and what, and Emily will describe how, what the next steps are in this process. Great, so um, I'm just gonna talk about like the mechanics of how to actually participate in the challenge. So basically in a nutshell, there's like three stages to the challenge. One is to get into the incubator. Uh, that's the first stage. The second stage is uh, down select to the finalists that will then be invited to participate in the third stage, which will then be the pitch and, and a demo session that's going to happen on the 15th of March, 2024. So today, the applications is, is for the to the proposal to actually get into the incubator is open until the 31st of August, and it's free. Um, the, and uh, the the requirements are basically that okay. So there's two two categories for the challenge. You can either apply for the high school um, level or the university startup level. And the only requirement that's needed is really that um, that you reside either in New Zealand, Australia, the Pacific Islands, uh, including the Philippines. So reside meaning it doesn't matter what kind of visa you have, as long as you're actually living in those uh, in those countries. So in terms of the incubator, we we actually do the incubator online, and this happens between October to February of 2024, with of, of course the holiday break uh, in between. And the uh, incubator includes uh, many webinar sessions about the problem area, and and also the the tools and 
and uh, and skills that you kind of like you will need for remote sensing and, and data analysis. Uh, there's also some mentorship and, and advising from specialists, as well as um, making sure, sure that we can kind of like uh, get you the satellite data that you probably uh, would need. Um, and the really the focus of this is to take to take that proposal that you said the that you um, created into an actual application by the end of the the incubator. So for the requirements, uh, basically um, it's very very simple. Um, one is like what who is on your team. So basically, what's the background of your of your team members, and then a basically a proposal that's between two to ten pages that includes you know um, what. Um, problem are you exactly uh, focusing on? What's your approach? What's your plans and your schedule? And then what also do you need um, to to actually create the solution? So again, the the uh, the proposals are open until the end of August. And then on the second stage, where basically is the actual final applications where you submit the final application on the 25th of February. Um, and again, there's only two requirements. One is a five minute video demonstration of your solution and then a presentation deck uh, describing your solution. So what we're trying to do is we're down selecting to three finalists per a category. So three for the secondary and three for the uh, university and startup. Um, and then uh, those will be invited to the final um, stage where those finalists will will then um, uh, pitch and, and and demo to get the grand prize uh, winner to receive 25,000 New Zealand dollars and then 8,000 for the secondary level with some other cash prizes for the finalists. In terms of the judging criteria, it's going to be the same for all three of those stages, except, of course, for the uh, uh, second stage and third stage where you're also being uh, judged with your prototype. But uh, in essence, it's really like, are, are you using this? Uh, are you using space technology? Are, is your methodology like scientifically based? Um, is it an innovative solution or is it is it new? Um, uh, the ease of implementation uh, as well, and also the environmental impact. The other four um, bullet points uh, here are extra points. So you get extra points for if uh, there's evidence that the, the solution will actually impact um, in three years, or uh, also collaborating with other multiple stakeholders, so other organizations, or also like potentially leveraging other um technologies in your solution and then lastly uh the, your team composition Let, does your team have what it takes to actually uh, get it to the finish line so uh yeah i just wanted to acknowledge uh, here that this uh challenge will not be um available and um without the sponsors and partners that we have and uh, so our, our sponsors and partners are like different space agencies to nonprofit organizations to um, corporations and and governments as well, like in in the different uh, parts of the Pacific. So that's kind of like the end of my briefing. Um, uh, again, what we're what we're trying to do here is like, of course, we're we're um, making sure that. Uh, people would know about the challenge and participate. Uh, and also, if you're either an expert, um, we're also looking for mentors and advisors or, or speakers at the incubator. Uh, and then also, we're also still looking for sponsors as well um, for the delivery of, of the program. Uh, again, this is just the, the link to the actual um, proposal application. So let me just like stop sharing here. And uh, so I'm going to segue to the second part of, of the session where um, we, uh, we have our guest speaker here, which is uh, Dr. Lehman, uh, who is speaking today um, to us also about the power of satellites and how it can be leveraged to solve global grand challenges uh, on Earth, um, which is, of course, a central tool that we're using for the Space for Planet Earth Challenge. Um, while we 
on the challenge, we're focused on methane. Uh, methane. Uh, satellite remote sensing has many applications all across the board, and this is kind of like um, where Dr. Lehman will be doing, uh, where he's presenting about starboard maritime intelligence developed by Zera Earth Observation Institute. So uh, just to ask uh, a way of introducing uh, Dr. Moritz. So Dr. Moritz Lehman is an oceanographer and remote sensing scientist. He leads uh, Starboard's biosecurity research and supports operations against illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing using satellite dark vessel detection. Um, Dr. Lehman is a well-published scientist and a skilled communicator. His work has been featured in several interviews for radio, newspapers, and TV. So um, welcome, uh, uh, Dr. Lehman, and uh, the floor is yours. Right, and just to note, we'll answer questions after, after this. Yeah, after this. Thank yeah, thanks, Emeline, for uh, for that introduction, and thanks to Space Base and Property One for the invitation. Um, now that you've covered the introduction, I'm going to dive right in, um, and um, go into my presentation here. So, question. Why do we go into space or why do we send things into space like satellites? And, uh, and, and there are many, many answers to that question. But I think undisputedly one of the main drivers and justifications for space exploration, space technology is to find out what goes on with our own planet. So we're going out to space to look back. <clears throat> And if you then, and I've got a rocket launch here on the screen that actually took astronauts into space. And if you look at what astronauts talk about most when they visit outer space, not outer space, the, the, the Earth orbit, um, they talk about they talk about the beauty of our planet and they talk about what they see. And in this particular case, the astronauts that were on this flight, um, this was the first American mission since the end of the shuttle program in 2011. So this launch happened uh, November 2020. And, and, and because it was American and because it was so, um, so such a, uh, an event of national pride, uh, it was greatly televised and greatly publicized. And, and, and so while the astronauts were hanging out in the capsule waiting to get to the right orbit for the International Space Station. Um, they talked about what what they were doing and they talked about what they were seeing. And all of a sudden, somebody said, oh, look, there's New Zealand. So they took the camera, it was a handheld camera, um, and, um, and they took it to the little porthole in the capsule and they captured this view of New Zealand. Uh, and, uh, and so, I, I really like this example because it just shows that they, they're looking out constantly to see what they see. Also, they love New Zealand. If you look at astronaut pictures um, uh, uh, on social media and elsewhere, New Zealand is probably the country that is pictured the most, talked about the most, although we haven't had a single astronaut from here to, <laughs> to go into space. Um, so that's just really like a quick anecdote um, that illustrates so we go into space to look back, but this has happened. We've realized this a long, long time ago. So the first mission, space mission, and this was an unmanned space mission, a satellite, to be devoted exclusively to looking at Earth was launched in 1972. So this was the first Landsat mission. It was called something else at that time, but we now call it Landsat 1. And it had a spectral camera on board that was measuring, that was taking pictures of Earth. And so this was revolutionizing um, science and geography and all kinds of fields, environmental monitoring. And uh, an incident, and, and, and many, many new discoveries had been made. For instance, whole new islands were discovered. So um, looking at, at coastal areas around the world uh, that were fairly inaccessible, um, islands like this, Called Skull Island due to the due to the shape here was discovered, uh, and then and and if you if you'd like to know more, there's a very good documentary that was filmed not too long ago with uh, Denzel Washington and Brie Larson 
um, and also side appearance of Godzilla. Um, and, and Landsat featured quite prominently in that story. <clears throat> now, uh, all joking aside, the logo for Landsat that's on here was made up, um, but the kernel of truth in this story is that Landsat actually discovered an island, or the data from Landsat was used to discover an island. This is off the northeast coast of Labrador, so northern Canada, and uh, many new islands that had not been charted before were discovered, including this one, um, then named Landsat Island. So you can look that up. There's a story on, on on a NASA blog, on Wikipedia, and elsewhere. So this is really, really quite remarkable. Um, and this happened in 1976. Since then, we've launched many, many more Earth observations into space. And here's just a small number of them. Most of these are still operational at this time. Um, in addition to unmanned satellites, we've, uh, we've added the um, Hubble Space Telescope and the International Space Station for good measure here. But you can see that it's a busy place up there. And, um, and, and we now have continuous high resolution, high quality data of the surface of our planet. Uh, a continuous, I mean, this is, this is happening daily. We've got beautiful images um, like this one here of Lake Tekapo. Uh, in the South Island, and and when we do the right type of processing to this data, they don't they're not just pretty pictures, but they can also reveal a lot about the underlying um, geological and biological or vegetation features or water quality. So um, by using the different channels of light, the different colors, and processing them in the right way, we can address questions that span from. Uh, how much grass is there in the pasture? What's the water quality? How much chlorophyll is there? Are there any diseases in the in the forestry area? Uh, what does irrigation do um, to our um, to our landscape? <clears throat> looking for erosion, looking for the effects of earthquakes, all those things. So, um, so this is really uh, the thing that 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 I, I believe and I'm most interested in is is to use environmental to use satellite data for to ask environmental questions and and you can not only ask questions such as um, how much biomass is somewhere in a certain area of the world in a forest or in a lake or um, uh, or uh, or what's the mineral composition of the rocks but you can because the coverage of satellites is continuous and repeating and we've got now since the Landsat launch, we've got now 50 years of data. Um, we have a time series and we can do change detection so we can see where things are going. And, and so I, I really hope that people who would take on the Methanesat challenge um, think about the things that we can find out about our environment and how it changes. But as alluded before, um, I'm going to now talk a little bit about what we actually do at Starboard. So the slides that you saw before uh, came from our work at Zero Earth Observation Institute, which is the parent company to Starboard. And we'll talk more about Starboard in a, in a second. So we were back then doing a lot of Earth observation to provide data products, to provide benefit to New Zealand, to New Zealand as a as a as a country, uh, to New Zealand industry and science and research. Um, we have then pivoted to look at what's happening um, on the global ocean. And we've built a platform called Starboard. And we're still using satellite observations and satellite data for Starboard. Um, but Starboard is essentially a platform that um, tracks ships globally. So in this particular slide here, um, we can um, see on the somewhere in the top left corner here uh, is an indicator that there's almost 250,000 dots on this map here. It's actually an animation. As you can see the time slider scrolling past at the bottom here. It's the ship positions over the last two days as they move through time. So each each movement of the time slider is an hour. <clears throat> and so this is real time and this is the real world. So this is what's actually happening. And there are uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of ships that transmit their location um, every every few seconds, every few minutes, sometimes half an hour. 
Um, so it's a vast amount of data, a vast amount of information. And, and this data comes from satellite, comes to us via satellite. So the positions are transmitted from transponders on ships through the Automated Identification System, or AIS. And then the, chat, the, the satellites are the communication relays, as it were, in space, so that ships on the open ocean that are not close to any receiving stations at the shore can be monitored and can be uh, it, it can can uh, to report their positions globally. So, so in a sense, this is kind of satellite data, but we don't really see it as satellite data. It's as much satellite data, perhaps, as you you know you you would think a satellite phone or a GPS unit that you might use on a hike is using satellite satellite technology. Um, but we're also using observational satellite data because what we're trying to do with starboard is to track vessels and figure out what they're doing. So we're trying to figure out, for example, are they fishing where they're not supposed to be fishing? Are they catching illegally? Are they transporting smuggling drugs? Are there any other nefarious activities that we might be interested in that, that are um, that we can that we can monitor from space? But if you're up to no good, you would probably try to disable your AIS unit and not transmit your position. So you'd hide your, your activities and then they would disappear from our map. And that's where we use observational satellite data to find vessels that are not actually reporting the AIS. And sometimes ships do silly things and do illegal things while they have their AIS on. Sometimes they just turn it off, uh, then they do something and then they turn it back on. So we do have sometimes in many cases an indication of where to look with satellite data and then we use different types of sensors to uh, to essentially find out where the ships are and what they might be up to so um, i've listed three here so we're using optical sensors optical sensors are the kind of the landsat type satellites that are actually take images as you can look at with your with your eyes and 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 see uh, what you would expect from an air photo. And we also uh, look a lot at sat uh, synthetic aperture radar. So synthetic aperture radar is an active sensor, uh, a radar unit on a satellite that's emitting radar waves that are then reflected by the surface or by the ship at sea and ping back. And then from that return signal, um, we get information of what's happening, um, what's down at sea. Or we look at uh, radio frequency geolocation sensors. And so those are sensors that are um, not really Earth observation because what they do is they look for, they detect radio frequency emitters. And for example, a marine VHF radio, like a walkie talkie at sea that you would um, turn on to communicate with somebody else, or a radar um, that you use for navigation, a, a whirly gig on top of a ship that's looking for other ships or for, for seabirds or icebergs. Um, so, uh, so those signals can be picked up from space and can tell us where ships are. And so these are the three primary satellite sensors that we're using um, to, to help us figuring out activity at sea. And I like to talk mostly here about synthetic aperture radar, because that's sort of, in my mind, the most interesting type of data for our purpose and also for many other environmental applications. So mentioned before, SAR is an active sensor that transmits radio waves and records the backscatter from these radio waves. So from the ocean surface, scatters of uh, waves and of structures on the ocean, such as ships. And the harder the surface, the stronger the return signal. And so we'll look at an, an example on the next slide. Um, and so the processing of this data creates a reflectivity image. It's not an optical image, but it's just kind of like a grayscale image that represents the intensity of the received signal over the scanned region. And on the on the slide here is a modeled overpass of Sentinel-1A. That's a satellite from the European Space Agency. And that is uh, continuously scanning the surface of the, of the Earth and collecting um, SAR data and making it available also for free um, through the uh, European data distribution hubs. 
<clears throat> so that's one of the satellites that we're using. The next slide here shows a SAR image from Radarsat 2. Radarsat 2 is a Canadian SAR satellite, and it's a bit better, um, a bit more useful for ship detection at sea because you can task it, you can tell it where to take an image and when within the orbital parameters. So the satellite has to be there, that's only one of it. Um, has to be over the right area, so you have to kind of pick and choose when and where you take your image, and then you have to pay for it. Um, and um, uh, but the advantage is you can tell it where to take an image. And for Sentinel One, it only has a set um, a set catalog, a set set area and time where it takes images, and it doesn't take um, images over the open ocean because it's primarily a coastal and terrestrial uh, sensor application. So radar set two can scan these fairly large areas, and this is um, an area in the Tasman Sea, so between New Zealand and Australia, and you can see um, Tasmania on the left of the screen there as well. <clears throat> and this grayscale map is essentially the process data, and you can see uh, structures in there, bright and dark patches and, and waves, and these are caused by by oceanographic features, so wave and wind patterns that change the reflectivity of the ocean in a certain way. And then what you're looking for when you're trying to find a ship is, is trying to find a really small bright spot. So it's essentially a needle in the haystack problem. You have all kinds of noise and and and, and signals from from other things, and you're looking for some really small bright dots. And what we've marked up here, on this map with squares um, is where our algorithm has found ships. So we've put a square over to, to make it more visible. And then what we do in the second step is we compare the locations that we found in the satellite image to known ship locations from our AIS database. So you can see you can see on the left of the screen here, um, here there, there are ships. Um, ship location, ship positions at the time of the satellite overpass, and there are also ships in this image here under these dots. When a dot, when a square is white, we've matched it to an AIS signal. When it's orange, we have not matched it. So uh, I'm going to go to the next slide and show you what this image actually looks like where we think there are ships. So zooming into this location here, um, the, the 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 zoom in um, the image chip here on the left shows a very bright spot that sort of elongated ship shape as it were um, in a in an in an ocean of of essentially gray and and so this is a this is a detection that very much looks like a ship plus we have an AIS signal coming from that area within a certain confidence bounds of a few hundred meters. And so we got a high confidence that that's an actual vessel. Uh, the orange dots here, we don't have a ship position associated in our AIS data set. But looking at the image in detail, there's a fairly bright spot here uh, in another area of, well, a little more signal variability or noise, um, but it could very well be a ship. <clears throat> So potentially, this is what we would call a dark vessel, a vessel that's not on AIS. And if you're looking for any illegal activity, that might be a target that you might want to check out. And in order to check it out, of course, you have to send a surveillance aircraft or a patrol boat um, to to get eyes on and and see what this is actually going, uh, what this is actually up to. And um, and that's a bit tricky because these things could be a long way out and it takes um, a lot of money and time to to get to these places. But if we didn't have this data, we wouldn't know at all what's going on where. So if you prepare and if you take several of these images and make a plan, um, these images can be extremely useful for monitoring fishing activity. And the area that we're monitoring, that we're looking at here, the Tasman Sea, is where southern bluefin tuna are caught. And southern bluefin tuna are probably the world's most expensive and most exclusive fish. And and so because of their high value, um, there's great interest in catching them, a great uh, return on catching them illegally, and therefore a good big regulatory pressure to make sure that this fishing resource is managed sustainably. 
So, so this is really what we're using satellite data for mostly in at starboard. We're trying to find things that we can't see from the self-reported positions through AIS. Now, um, in this particular synthetic aperture radar example, there are a few similarities to what you, you know, what, what you'll find with methane set. For example, the satellites that have been taking these images are flying in low Earth orbits. So these satellites circle the Earth several times a day, but they don't fly over the same spot on Earth every day. So there's a return period. So they have a return period from three to four days or a week. And so you have to wait a number of days before you can image the same area again um, and, and build up your time series that way. Um, the data that comes back from the satellite is complicated. As you can see from the SAR image, it takes a great deal of processing. We're actually using a machine learning model here that is detecting these bright spots. And, and, um, and so these are tasks that you could not do by hand. And, and, and that's another sort of maybe an idea for a challenge to set up processing methods for, for using large amounts of complicated data. And there'll also be a lot of data. So these images are fairly large. And if you have, uh, if you have repeat coverage, you'd be dealing with a lot of data. And so there needs to be some, uh, some efficient way of actually looking at and processing it. Um, this actually brings me to the end of my presentation. I'd like to leave lots of time for question. Uh, in conclusion, if you're thinking about participating in the challenge, and you're thinking about, well, what should I work on? It, what usually helps me when I think about, well, what do I want to work on next? Or so is I, I think about what I'm interested in. Am I interested in the questions that the data can answer? So in the in in the uh, question in for methane set, for example, how much is methane is being emitted and where? So those questions that have really been driving the development of the mission. Are there sources we did not know about? And how do these sources change over time? So, so these are sort of the fundamental questions that the, the mission is trying to answer. But if you're more interested in the technology and the, and, and the, and the, the fundamental science, there's also a place for, for you there. And you can ask questions on how can we improve the algorithms um, that are you being used? Because essentially, Methane sat is a spectrometer. It measures light at a certain wavelength and it measures the intensity of that light. It doesn't measure methane directly, but it measures the absorption of methane in the atmosphere by measuring by measuring light. So there is a there is a um, a transfer function. There's a relationship, an algorithm that that it needs to be developed. And these algorithms, like any algorithms, have uncertainties and they can be improved. So how could you possibly improve the, this algorithm? Perhaps because there is a certain area where methane set isn't great. If there are diffuse clouds, for example, and I'm not a methane set um, uh, expert, so I'm just kind of talking about what I what I know about optical images, where where we're struggling with the same questions. If there are just some clouds in there, they change the absorption properties of the atmosphere, and we have problems detecting you know, what really the ground look, looks like. So, um, so there's some really, really interesting questions on, on both sides, on the application side, as well as the sort of fundamental science side. And of course, the computational side is, is super interesting as well. So I hope I've provided some useful information here and, and, and maybe um, gave a little bit of uh, ideas for further thought and idea development. Um, and yeah, if you're curious about any of the stuff that I've talked about, send me an email, moritz.lehmann at Starboard. Uh, you can follow Starboard on Twitter and on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, we really like to like to hear and answer questions and uh, I'll pass back to the organizers. Thank you very much for listening.
Yeah, thank thanks you. so much. More, um, thanks so much, Moritz. Uh, that that was really fascinating. And uh, yeah, your your uh, your suggestions for questions are spot on with uh, potentially what uh, the applicants in in the challenge could could actually work on. So yeah, that was really great. Cool. Am I still sharing? Uh, nope. uh, no, yeah. I think you're good. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Excellent. Oh, I'm here. I think Meg, I think you're still muted. Sorry, I, I would love to throw that question um, back to you, um, Emmeline and Eric as well. And and a huge thank you, Moritz. Um, I don't think I'll ever look at the the night sky again, but um, the same again. Um, but I'm also <laughs> just super super glad that our our seas are are so well protected. You know, I, I personally didn't have um, much of an idea that that it was so comprehensive in you know what what's happening behind the scenes. So so thank you for taking the time to. Take us through what you do. It's awesome. Um, so yeah, Emmeline and Eric, where where, where can people start? Or, or... Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we have um, uh, we're going to be providing links to you know some of the research that people have done on. Uh, uh, they've especially taken some of like you mentioned uh, the long history of Landsat images. It turns out that. Some people were clever and realized that if you took certain ratios of the near infrared bands in Landsat, you could detect some of the stronger emissions from methane. And so, um, and in a similar way with the Sentinel 2, uh, the uh, so with, there's so some of these uh, satellites uh, have have managed to detect uh, very strong emissions of, of methane. Um, but uh, we also uh, talking with uh, the methane set science team is also put their instruments on a uh, aircraft and are doing test flights around parts of the US and we're going to be making some of that data available and it's interesting that you know they can they can fly for three hours in circles m monitoring certain area and uh, they're getting ready in the future, the methane satellite will be able to pick that up in, in a matter of 10 seconds or so. Um, and so it's it illustrates the power of, of being in, yeah. in orbit. Uh, but if you, but they're getting some very interesting uh, detections, not only from strong emitters, uh, but also uh, picking up uh, uh, sort of mysterious uh, uh, emissions around you know certain cities they think some are are landfills some but some are remain mysterious and so yeah but that and that alludes to i think that really that great question of like what other methane yeah. are out there yeah and so we're so the the challenge is open to you know anything that sort of advances the state of the art you know or you know uh or different you know pursuing different aspects of this from using some of these existing satellite data to using uh, to you know looking at uh, you know there there even NIWA is interested in you know with looking at uh, land use and modeling where they expect in the future to target uh, for agriculture emissions or other sources. So um, we're we're trying to just uh, encourage people to you know invite people to put in ideas uh, across the board and uh and i just hope i think it would benefit from anybody would benefit from going into the incubator you can change your ideas during the incubator and and uh, come up with some final solution and i and also should mention that even if you're not in the incubator we have a back door which is at uh in the at the final um, application, you know, when I talk about a second stage of, of yeah, uh, in February when you when you submit your your application to be in the in the final competition, you don't have to have gone through the incubator. You can just go in at the very end and, right. and submit something. Awesome. Hey, um, huge thank you um, to both yourself, Emmeline and Eric, for, for hosting us today. Um, and uh, once again, Moritz as well. Um, and just um, before we close off, um, where if people do have further questions from today, um, where, where should they direct them to? 
Yeah, so um, normally it's just uh, all of the information is on spacebase.co, so on, on the right. website, uh, and right. go at the menu challenges. And also, if you have specific questions as well, uh, just send us an email at info at spacebase.co, um, and uh, we'll, we'll see if we can, we can answer any of uh, your queries. Awesome. And um, Luke, Lucas, uh, we'll distribute the uh, meeting recording to all of the attendees today. Um, as well as hosting um, uh, on either the Priority One website or YouTube channel. Um, and um, likewise, um, Space Base may, may also be able to host this recording on, on one of their sites too. So um, awesome. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and we'll close off. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Perfect timing. Bye. <laughs> Bye.